Yeah, I'm here to talk about uh, getting Garrett on Kubernetes. So why did we go with Kubernetes? Well, when I was talking with Luca about the project, he had this wonderful little uh, gem hidden away, which was the, uh, the Garrett dashboard analytics tooling. That was uh, quite a nice little piece of kit. And um, it would help accelerate our project quite a lot. But what would it have taken to actually get there? Uh, it would have taken Garrett server, which is at least one machine, if not two or three, uh, a Spark cluster, which is going to be a master, all its workers, um, and then a Elasticsearch cluster to store that data in and run Kibana on. So that's another three or more machines. So at least six, if not eight, ten machines with different profiles and configurations. And you know how that story goes. It's uh, one server at a time, configure, configure, configure. So what we did instead was we thought, you know, we're going to Kubernetes in general. And um, the more internal tooling and things we were deploying, we said it, Kubernetes is a great target platform for this stuff. It should simplify our DevOps and our uh, deployment efforts an awful lot. Uh, so Kubernetes basics, uh, how does it work? It's a control plane and you get a couple of worker nodes. Simple kind of distributed workload kind of concept. You give it a workload, you talk to the API and say, here, I have this workload to do. Will you go do it? It distributes the workload. It comes back with a result saying, yeah, I deployed that. That's all good. It works. So in a uh, sort of server environment, you, you break these components out into individual instances. The master is your control plane. You have your worker nodes. And what's really nice is they're just a bunch of computers. There's nothing special about each individual instance. Um, but you can span that out massively. Um, and this is just like multiple masters to make the actual control plane resilient. And then you can have groupings of nodes for different purposes. Maybe they don't have different software installed, but they have different hardware profiles, maybe GPUs for uh, machine learning and things like that. So you can actually tag and identify these individually. And then that allows you to grow the estate of workers. But they're still just a bunch of computers. There's nothing special about each, in, in, each individual node. So when you deploy something onto it, especially if it's a web service, you have this software abstraction, which is a service which sits in front of your applications. So that, what's nice about that is it can span multiple nodes in your cluster. So you can see you've got different pods. So each pod is a container just running your application. There can be other components in that pod beside just the main application container. And the service then will route requests from any client through to the pods that support that application. Uh, but they can be located anywhere in your cluster. It doesn't really matter. So is it better than you know, traditional network and server configuration operations kind of behaviors? In a good world, in a cloudy environment, you'd be able to set up your base image using Packer or something like that to build a base image and that nice and machine as code. Then you have to configure your network, your DNS, you deploy individual actual servers, maybe they're VMs. Um, and you can run your images onto those. You have to add storage for each instance that has to run something like that. Then you have to go out to the edge of your network again and go, oh, yeah, I have to put a load balancer so that people can actually talk to these services. Then finally, um, you might have other managed services, hosted services that you want to put into your stack, like RDS and databases. Um, and then the last, last step is actually run the configuration management to push your application into the servers. Um, so there's an awful lot of touch points there. I mean, there's loads of steps. And when we go back to, you know, I want to set up this Garrett stack, six or 10 different servers, each one having maybe, maybe each group of two or three servers having network and load balancer and storage requirements of their own. So there's an awful lot of dependency and configuration to manage. So is it better if you go back to this model? If you just go, I have my worker nodes. They're just a bunch of computers. I don't care which ones they are. I have my workload defined, and you attach your dependencies to it. So you just define which of all your workloads is fine. Uh, here's the dependencies I need. So then you pass them through to the actual cluster. And Kubernetes does a very cool thing. It can talk out to the environment. It says, right, I need this DNS setup. I need this load balancer configured. I need a database, and I need these block storage devices set up for each pod and connected to them. And so you only touch one point of, uh, of interaction with the system, which is the API. You just said, API go do this work for me, set up all these dependencies, and it just goes and does it. So uh, that's a rather nice story, I find. When I wanted to put Garrett onto the Kubernetes cluster, 
I had to think of when I have no cluster, what do I have to do to get a cluster with enough ability to supply all those dependencies that from then on, it's a simple task just to run the application. So the walkthrough of how to set up the cluster is really just a discussion on what are components that help in the ecosystem of tooling in Kubernetes that you can actually deploy? Uh, and what's the walkthrough on my opinionated repo that I've, I'm going to share later today? Um, that will give a worked example of how to set up Garrett from scratch. In fact, set up Kubernetes from scratch in AWS and have Garrett running on top of it by the end of the, the walkthrough. So step one, OK, so the tools I'm using. So COPS is a. Uh, rather neat uh, sort of Golang binary, which has all the options and configuration management intelligence to talk to AWS, VMware, Azure, and provision all the sort of uh, cloudy dependencies you need to get a cluster going, uh, and then load a cluster in place as you need it, including all the machines that you've defined by default. There's a whole bunch of other tooling that this kind of wraps up into uh, the overall setup as well. and. Um, my example has all of these included. And then, of course, there's some more aspirational things I'd love to add later on to sort of complete the overall setup of a uh, really good production-ready example of a Garrett environment. Uh, in fact, a cluster for lots of purposes, not just Garrett. Step two, the deployment. This is what the first step will create. Create your public subnets, uh, an SSH ELB, so you can actually SSH into the bastion and all the uh, nodes afterwards. It creates. <coughs> the three availability zones, so a subnet in each of those availability zones, your worker nodes and your master, creates the S3 bucket as well, so it stores all its state. And all this is just like automatically scripted and set up and it's all hands off, one command, done. Next step is just install Helm. So Helm is the package manager, uh, which is what you bundle the definition of your applications and the dependencies and everything into in guess what language? YAML. <laughs> Loads of YAML. Um, so how does it work, roughly? Yeah, there you go. I did just set it. I should have waited for this slide. Uh, yeah, you take your deployments, your database definitions, your load balancers, any other custom resources you want to define. They're all YAML files in a templates directory. There's a chart YAML, which sort of versions the chart, allows you then to package it up into a tarball, which you can throw into like a folder or even a web server to be like a chart repository uh, for use and sharing. Then you could combine that with a, value, a values YAML file, uh, which just defines the custom settings for an individual deployment, and it gets executed by Helm. So as I said, take the values and the tarball, and it pushes it onto the server, a little component called Tiller. That's what I'm talking about setting up right now. It's just a little, uh, little daemon that sits in the cluster, receives commands for the deployments, and goes, right, I can track the state of your deployment. And then it rolls out the workloads onto the different servers as needed, based on the definitions in the chart. How do you actually get into a cluster from the outside? Or how do you talk to an application that's inside a cluster? What you use is an ingress uh, controller, the green thing in the middle there, which is an Nginx container, Docker container. Uh, it has a sort of operator in the background, which is looking out for services that are deployed. And as you can see there, ingress class name equals name. You can call it what you like. Uh, what that does is that you, when you deploy a pod, you don't have to tell us, oh, yeah, and Nginx, by the way, this is where this service is, blah, blah, blah. No, the service says, I want to be uh, served from the outside world by this particular instance name of an ingress. So yeah, you have to know one value. But you set that in your actual service definition in your Helm chart. You deploy your application. And then what happens is Nginx goes, oh, I see a service with my class name on it. I'll hook into that and serve your application for you. There's a really handy thing, the green thing on the left, which is a, another little tool called external DNS, which is another little operator, which sits on the server and goes, right, I see an ingress. So it watches for all ingress definitions and says, ah, I've got something called with a host name. I'll go and populate root 53 or Azure DNS and Google DNS and whatever environment you're in, it can talk to them all. And it will create the actual application uh, host name. But it creates a C name, which points to the alias for the load balancer that the Nginx is actually loading into it. It's very clever. And then Cert Manager, because we want SSL. It can talk out to Let's Encrypt and get certs. Similar to the uh, external DNS component, the cert at the bottom left there is uh, like a request. 
You send in a cert object into the cluster. The cert manager goes, oh, there's a new cert object. Goes out to Acme, creates the request, validates it, and then eventually that uh, secret gets populated and you have a working certificate. Because I know loads of you guys are going like, oh, yeah, but what about internal? We're not allowed to use, like, city off-the-shelf, let's encrypt. We have internal SSL certificates. Well, cert manager has a pluggable backend. So it will serve a certificate authority, but all of which is like your internal CA that you can sign your certs, but also it can offload all this work to HashiCorp Vault. So you can have a centralized HashiCorp Vault as a CA cert server in your internal infrastructure. It doesn't have to be on the Kubernetes cluster at all, just be out in the network. And cert manager can talk to that and provision certs. Storage, Rook is a operator that sits on the cluster and manages POSIX-compatible file system, which is immediately consistent. So it's a really neat sort of storage layer. What it allows us to do is create uh, mirrored, replicated copies of file systems across the cluster. One of the issues with storage in Kubernetes, especially in a cloud environment, is in the case of Amazon, if you create an EBS volume, attach it to an instance, that EBS volume is only available in the uh, availability zone that that instance is in. EBS volumes are locked to the availability zone within a data center. Um, what you do instead is you put a software layer which creates cross-availability zone replication uh, of many EBS volumes, and then you get a software RAID concept in a way, a clustered uh, file system. So those are the advantages. Removes the single point of failure versus something like NFS. Linear impact to performance when scaling horizontally. If you need more clients, you need more storage nodes that are supplying those files, it actually does perform really well at scale. It doesn't degrade as you grow. And most comparative tests I've seen online, uh, running NFS on the same hardware as a Ceph cluster, generally say, yeah, it outperforms NFS as well. So that's nice. Um, there's multiple storage models within the cluster. It allows you to do block storage, which is like block devices, object storage, which is like S3. So it actually has an S3 compliant or a, uh, what's the other one, Swift? I think it opens Shift Swift uh, object store uh, compliant sort of API. And it provides the one and bold file system, which is uh, the shared read, write, many type storage. Disadvantages. Anyone know how to run Ceph? Not me. <laughs> but thankfully, Rook does. So we run Rook on the cluster. It takes care of the work. Then you just have to read bit documentation to learn how to tune it. So step seven, finally, actually deploying Garrett. You've got all these components ready to help you serve your application. And this is more or less the application architecture that you end up with. You can have multi-master with HA plugin, uh, use your Ceph pool to create the shared file system behind them. If you need Postgres because you don't, you know, have something that is as resilient as uh, better versions of Garrett that don't need databases. And then, of course, your Nginx controller has the SSL termination sorted for you, so you don't have to deal with that internally in the application. Um, and that's it. It's really simple. After all that effort and all that complexity up front, from then on, every time you run an application, it's as simple as that. Three-tier application kind of concept. Um, really nice. I've got the cluster working. I've got that, uh, that structure more or less ready. I'd like to get to multi-master at the cluster level, get the monitoring, centralized logging working, all this sort of stuff. So what I have here is it's running on a Kubernetes cluster. And if we want to see the logs of it running, we can see them all here. And we can also see that the version is, can you make that out? 2.15 at the moment. So just for fun, I thought we would, like, there's a test project there. Let's go to 2.16, just see it work. So Helm chart is being deployed. This is uh, just a little bash script that's wrapping environment variables so it knows how to talk to the cluster. So all it does is this. Helm upgrade Garrett master. This is the deployment name. There's your actual chart path where the actual uh, files are. Uh, the COPS cluster name, which is just uh, a naming scheme I'm using for hosting a folder of configuration just for an individual cluster. And then it waits for it to deploy, tells it what namespace you're sticking it into. I'm cheating and putting in kube system. This is bad practice. Don't do this. So that command finished, and you get a nice sort of output of what it created. I see RSH2F. Yes, that's a different ID to what was there before. So hopefully, oh yeah, and we can see the version. It's actually 2.16. Let's refresh. 
I see 216 at the footer. Isn't that good news? Live update of Kubernetes, and, and the test project is still there, so that it kept all the data. Isn't that great? Is that real? So you've created from 215 to 216, snapping your fingers. I want to see the magic. <laughs> oh, you go. Hello. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so I saw that you're using um, Rook and Ceph. So this is kind of like a contention point for at least my organization, like sure. among so many different container <laughs> storage options. So I saw on your alternate list, like you also mentioned, like GlusterFS and all that. Like, have you ever had a chance to actually try GlusterFS versus Ceph? Or we're yeah. also using like OpenEBS. And yeah, last year. Um, we did a demo setup on VMware, and <coughs> we tried to uh, test the performance of Gluster, and it it didn't scale, in, at least in our efforts. Maybe we were doing something wrong, but our experience was that we didn't get Gluster to scale that well. Um, Ceph, I haven't had much chance to performance test it yet, but the anecdotal evidence on the internet says it should. So <laughs> this is our hope. Uh, contentious issue, yeah, I, I, I don't have anything to back that up. So I'm, I'm just going on what I've read and what I hope is true. So why was Kubernetes chosen above uh, DCOS, Mesos Mars, yeah. which would be the more enterprise yeah. um, deployment mechanism? So uh, the projects I was working on were all kind of um, uh, migrating to AWS as an environment. So to create real automated orchestration in that environment, I don't need DCOS. However, there is a project I'm looking at to run on Hetzner of all places uh, to stick DCOS under Kubernetes. And that should be kind of a fun experience. Um, I mean, for us, the, the DCOS idea is, I, I think I said something like this uh, yesterday. Um, DCOS has the kind of uh, orchestration of the environment as a real strength. Mm -hmm. And then Kubernetes, kind of is the leading orchestra or the uh, scheduler. So if you get Kubernetes to talk to DCOS to orchestrate the environment rather than directly to the environment, then you might benefit from DCOS's abstraction of power and uh, ability, you know, with the amount of environments it can support, whereas Kubernetes doesn't have to chase that dragon forever. So yeah. <laughs> you can separate the concerns quite well. Yeah, the, so the, it will be really interesting to look at that. And that's something myself and another friend of mine in work are, are thinking about looking at. So yeah. I think Kubernetes, yeah, as a scheduler and stuff, is absolutely it's definitely a strength. strength, strength. Yeah. Um, yeah. And DCOS, you know, the things like service discovery that it has mm. means you're not running all our external components in order to do that because they're built mm. into DCOS and the real strength of it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Best I wonder, yeah I'd, I'd wonder what components I've plugged in here today uh, would be of, you know, what's the word, deprecated because of it or, you yeah. know, yeah, but it'd be interesting to see. So, yeah, in the future, that's, that's a plan anyway.